I'm going to talk uh, this afternoon about what might be what the uh, future of civil rise might be. Talk about what's causing it. Talk about global impacts, local impacts, and then talk about adaptation. I am actually uh, trained as a civil engineer, so I'm actually most interested in what the impacts of climate change are going to be, and then how we're going to adjust or adapt to these climate change impacts. Because, as, as Ron mentioned, and other scientists certainly agree with this. Um, the most we can do right now is slow down climate change. We can't reverse it. So we have to think how we're going to adapt or live with this changed climate and, and right, you know, change sea levels, more intense precipitation, and so on. So what causes this level to rise? Uh, first of all, as the ocean gets warmer, the, the water expands. It takes up more volume. Second, as, as Ron talked about, we get melting of ice on land. So the melting of, of ice on Greenland and the Arctic uh, and, the, and the Antarctic. And then also there are regional impacts. For example, if the ocean circulation slows down, again, as, as Ron implied, is going to happen. If the Gulf Stream slows down, that's going to cause the silver rise to increase in the northeast. So for example, that could, could give us an additional eight inches sea level rise in New England if the Gulf Stream slows down. In other parts of the world, the changes in the circulation will actually uh, lower the sea level rise. So again, it depends where you are. Another phenomenon which impacts sea level rise is subsidence, which is the natural selling of land. And again, that's unrelated to climate change. So for example, in New England, in, in Boston, over the last 100 years, we've had about a foot of sea level rise relative to the land. About six inches of that is because of, of global impacts. Uh, melting and, and, and warming of the oceans. And the other six inches is because of the subsidence or natural selling of the land. And, um, you know, uh, as Ron pointed out, over the last, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, we've had fluctuations in temperature and sea level rise. But over the last uh, hundred years, the rate of sea level rise globally has been about 1.7 millimeters per year. For the last decade, that accelerated to about 3.1 millimeters, millimeters per year. And, um, you know, sort of illustrative for this change is what's happened to the ice in Greenland, where in the period from 1979 to 2008, the total melt area of the Greenland ice sheet increased by about uh, 30%. Now, what might happen in the future? Um, well, as Ron again pointed out, we're really uncertain as to what the exact amount of sea level rise is going to be in the future. We're uncertain for two reasons. One is we don't know what the emissions of greenhouse gases are going to be. That's really a social political question. The other issue is we don't, we don't really fully understand the, the climate system. It's still too complex. However, we have some good estimates of what the uh, sea level rise might be. Uh, for example, uh, a paper published by uh, Stefan Ramsdorf in 2007 estimated that the range of sea level rise globally by uh, uh, 2050 might be 20 to 50 centimeters. And for those of you that uh, don't work in uh, metric units, there's about two and a half centimeters per inch. Okay? So by 2050, we could see a global sea level rise of about 20 to 50 centimeters. Actually, um, Tim, you might go about two slides ahead to catch up. Uh, that's good, okay. Um, and then by uh, 2100, the range might be from uh, 50 to 140 centimeters. Okay, so the next couple of decades, you might see an increase of about 20 to 50 centimeters. By uh, end of the century, the increase might be 50 centimeters to 140 centimeters. So note that we're a lot more confident in the near-term range. Um, now, uh, 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 Ramsdorf and his colleagues uh, in 2009 published another paper where they estimated the range in 2050, instead of being 20 to 50 centimeters, would be 30 to 60 centimeters. And instead of the range in 2100, instead of it being 50 to 140, was 75 to 190 centimeters. Most scientists feel that the most uh, silver rise we're going to have in the next 100 years is about 2 meters. Okay, so we're going to see maybe 1 meter, 2 meters in the next 100 years. And what are the impacts this going to be? Um, we're going to see, first of all, uh, just more coastal erosion. The higher sea level is going to further erode our beaches. Second of all, we're going to see um, perhaps flooding of our wetlands. 
the wetlands could not migrate inland. So you might see a wetland, like for example, along Route 1 uh, going up uh, north of Boston. Well, that, 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 that highway is going to block the movement of the wetland that bores that, um, that highway. And, and the other impact, of course, is uh, coastal flooding. You know, a storm, that surge, storm, surge, storm surge that comes in, let's say, at this elevation, with a couple of feet of slope rise, is going to come in at this high elevation and cause a lot more damage. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the impacts of, of, of silver rise and wetlands. As I said earlier, we're going to uh, you know, lose a lot of our coastal wetlands uh, because of silver rise if the wetlands cannot migrate inland. And we're very concerned about this. You know, first of all, wetlands are very important just because in their own right, but also they're very important because of the services they provide humans, the so-called ecosystem uh, benefits, <coughs> ecosystem services. And wetlands, coastal wetlands, are very important for ecosystem services because, first of all, they assimilate waste that runs off the land. They are important recreational sites. And also, they're very important for mitigating floods. If you have a coastal city with a wetland bordering between it and the ocean, when you get a flood, that wetland will absorb some of the force of the storm surge. One of the major problems we had in the Gulf of Mexico when Hurricane Katrina struck was a lot of the wetlands had been compromised and the flooding, the storm surges, was a lot worse than it would have been uh, if the wetlands had been intact. So um, again, it's very important that um, we do everything we can to preserve these coastal wetlands. Also, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, globally. You know, right now, uh, there's, about there's about 200 million people that live in floodplains. By um, the year 2080, there could be, could be double, could be 400 million people that live in floodplains. And that's based upon fairly conservative estimates of sea level rise and um, uh, uh, population growth. And most of these changes are going to be in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And I was involved in a study the, the World Bank uh, recently released about the cost of adaptation. And they estimated that the uh, cost of, uh, in, in the developing world and in the transitioning world, to adapt to uh, silver rise impacts, the extra adaptation costs could be about $30 billion a year for the period 2010 to 2050, okay? So that's the incremental cost of protecting the world from silver rise in the developing and transitional world. That's $30 billion a year for 20 years. And of course, 30 years, 40 years. And of course, that would continue beyond that period because silver rise is gonna continue after, um, you know, well beyond this century. Also, um, I want to point out that many people in these floodplains, in, in, in both in and outside the U.S., are often, um, uh, you know, relatively poor communities who are already facing other environmental injustices, the so-called environmental justice community. And these groups often have the least capacity to adapt to the additional stress of climate change. And as a side, I, I also, um, I was talking to someone earlier about this, I hope when they rebuild Haiti, they make it climate change resilient as well as earthquake resilient, because it's really an opportunity to go in there and try to do something right. In terms of the U.S., um, in, uh, in the Northeast here in Massachusetts, we're also very vulnerable to coastal flooding. For example, in the blizzard of 1978, when we, were, when we had the highest recorded sea levels in, in Massachusetts, um, that caused about a billion dollars worth of damage in $2,000 to and damages and emergency cost to Massachusetts. And that was what we call a 20-year storm. So that's a storm that occurs in the average once every 20 years. Um, and um, I talk late, and so um, that's, that's a pretty common event, so to speak. And um, another way to look at uh, our vulnerability in the Northeast to sea level rise is to look at how we're going to change the frequency of the 100-year flood. They said earlier, you know, the 100-year flood has a, has a, occurs in the average once every 100 years. If you live in the 100-year floodplain, 100-year coastal floodplain, you're regulated by the, uh, by the state and the federal emergency, uh, federal emergency management agency. You're generally required to have uh, floodplain insurance, and if you build something new in the 100-year flood, floodplain, you have to build a certain way. So, so what happens in the 100-year floodplain is some indicator of the impacts of future climate change. So I was involved in a study with some colleagues from UMass Boston to ask the question, well, under climate change, 
what might the frequency of the flooding in the 100-year floodplain change in the future. So we found that uh, by 2050, the 100-year floodplain in Boston could decrease to a recurrence interval of about three years. So what that means in a couple of decades from now, you know, four decades, uh, if you're in a 100-year floodplain, you might say, wow, you know, I'm pretty safe. On the average, we're only going to flood once every 100 years. By 2050, you could get flooded in the average once every three years, okay? By 2100, that frequency could decrease to less than two years. And if we go down the uh, East Coast, this, down, down other parts in, this, in the East Coast, we find uh, New London, Connecticut, uh, the frequency would decrease to about 50 years by 2050. New York City would decrease by about 50 years by 2050. In Atlantic City, the 100-year floodplain recurrence interval would decrease to about four years by 2050, okay? And then similar decreases by uh, 2100. The reason New York and the reason Boston and Atlantic City change so much, so dramatically, is because they're in the open ocean. You know, the other places like uh, New London, New York City are sheltered by Long Island. Okay, but even a switch from 100-year flood frequency to a 50-year flood fr frequency is quite dramatic. Now, uh, again, another way we can talk about impacts in a region is to look at uh, the extent of the flooding. And um, so, for example, in, in the um, northern part of Boston, the present area that gets flooded once every 100 years is essentially the area that's, that's east of Atlantic Avenue. Okay, so it just goes along the, the coastline there. So the area where the aquarium is, okay? Um, the 100-year flood that may occur in, uh, by the end of the century would actually flood all the area to the, to the, to the, um, to the west of Atlantic Avenue flood the area around the Boston Garden, flood Faneuil Hall, and flood parts of the North End, okay? So that would occur on the average once every 100 years. So it would be a great increase in 100-year floodplain. Now, in, in um, our fair city of Cambridge, um, would also be very vulnerable to flooding. Right now, Cambridge is protected from the 100-year coastal flood because of the Charles River Dam. That dam is only a foot or so above the present 100-year flood. So if we have a civil rise of a couple of feet, which is, which is gonna happen, then we get a 100-year flood. That flood is gonna go up the river and flood um, Ch Charles River Basin. So that would flood um, essentially the area, it would flood MIT, it would flood the basement of, of Ron's building, it would flood the basement, where I, flood the building where I used to work in, it would flood uh, parts of Harvard, it would flood Alston around Harvard Stadium, it would flood Back Bay, uh, it would flood, essentially all the land that's built on fill would be flooded. And moreover, there's a reasonable chance that uh, uh, you know, if we have a high, high rate of civil rise, this area could be flooded actually when we have a high, just by a high tide, not alone, not alone having, let alone having a storm to uh, make it worse. And, and other, you know, other parts of the country face similar problems. For example, New York City, is gonna face the same, little, same sort of flood problems as Boston. Miami, um, they report the, uh, the Miami-Dade County Task Force on Climate Change uh, reported that uh, with the sea level rise, the freshwater resources will be gone. The Everglades will be inundated on the west side of Miami-Dade. Barrier Islands will be loud, largely inundated. Storm surges will be devastating. Um, San Francisco. San Francisco Bay Conservation Development Commission reported that with a civil rise of 55 inches, 270,000 people in the Bay Area will be at risk in, from flooding, 98% more people than currently at risk. Risk of buildings and contents, $62 billion, loss of wetlands, and so on. Um, Eastern Shore of Maryland, again, that's already in peril right now from 100-year, that's already in peril from 100-year floods. In well, a couple of decades, uh, what gets flooded now by floods but it's flooded now at high tides. Now, how are we going to, so we're going to have severe impacts from uh, climate change on sea level rise. I want to talk a little bit about how we adjust to it, okay, the process of adaptation. And when I first, first started working on adaptation about 15 years ago, my environmental friends essentially stopped talking to me because they said, if you start talking about adaptation, you're giving up on mitigation. But of course, um, you know, the first, step of adaptation is, mitigate, is mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions. But because the inertia of the climate system and the lack of agreement at forums like Copenhagen, 
We've got to figure out how we're going to live with this changed climate. Okay, we've got to start adjusting. And in terms of coastal flooding, there are a couple of things we can do. First of all, we can do nothing, okay? Just live with the flooding as it goes on. And other policies accommodate the flooding. So there's things like, like flood proofing, elevating buildings. Um, another way is, is protecting against flood proofing. So um, this can be done with harder, soft structures. So a hard structure might be like building a seawall to keep the flooding out, or building a beach up with sand to keep the flooding from overtopping the beach. The other thing we can do is retreat from the floodplain, uh, meaning that we either retreat during the, flood plain of, during the flood event, like evacuation, or we can you know, permanently move people out of the floodplain. And um, adaptation, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we actually do adaptation. What, 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 what should be the characteristics of a good adaptation strategy? And I use the word strategy because it's really a dynamic process, because we're uncertain of the climate change, any adaptation plan is going to, have to be dynamic. I mean, if we keep adjusting as we, learn more, as we learn more about the climate change. So the concept of master planning, let's say for urban areas, is really dead. We have to think about dynamic planning to adjust for the changing climate. So a couple of things. As, as those who can see the slide, next couple of slides, a bunch of words up there. But first of all, a climate change adaptation strategy should be robust. By robust, I mean that uh, the plan will work no matter what the climate change is. Okay, so no matter whether we have two feet of silver rise or four feet of silver rise, the adaptation plan will still function. Also, the adaptation plan may have to be adjustable, may be flexible. So as we learn more about the climate change, we can adjust the, 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 the adaptation strategy. So again, example of a beach. If we you know, build up a beach dune system somewhere to protect a region, perhaps we add more sand to it to adjust. And then also, adaptation strategy must be based upon a scenario-based risk assessment process. By scenarios, I mean, uh, in planning jargon, that's how we deal with uncertainties. We build scenarios of the future, and we plan for those different scenarios. Risk, I mean, we have to adjust a plan, so given a certain scenario, we can manage the various risks associated with that. And one of the important parts of adaptation planning is also working with stakeholders. You know, um, there's been much research in the last couple of decades that shows that working with stakeholders in a participatory manner results in a lot better decision making in, in natural resource management than not working with stakeholders. Working with stakeholders is particularly critical in climate change adaptation because uh, adaptation is generally a local process. We're going to ask people to do things and deal with, you know, different activities like beach nourishment or seawalls or evacuation plan. So it's very important to be involved with stakeholders. Also, adaptation plans might have the characteristics of no regret policies, meaning that it makes sense to do that adaptation now if we didn't have the climate change. Also, an adaptation policy might have co-benefits, meaning that you know, it helps, let's say, flood controls as well as, as, well as it helps water quality. Also, um, adaptation planning should integrate the built and natural environments. When I talked about the example of the wetlands, so if I'm trying to figure out how to protect, let's say, um, the city. I was down in Groton, Connecticut yesterday. So we're talking about how do we protect Groton, Connecticut from flooding. Well, if you think about how do we protect the barrier islands off of Groton, as well as protecting the mainland, which is built up. So you have to integrate a plane of the built and natural environment. Also, um, you know, there are all the things going on besides climate change. I mean, there's globalization, population growth, land use change. They'll all have to be considered when we do um, adaptation planning. And to give you um, a little bit of example of some local adaptation planning, I'm involved in this project in East Boston. And um, East Boston right now um, is relatively safe from the present 100-year flood. But in a couple of decades, um, parts of East Boston uh, could, um, uh, could suffer some fairly severe coastal flooding. Uh, East Boston is actually located you know, uh, uh, on the eastern side of Boston on the eastern side of the Mystic River. It's essentially, it's peninsular, and it's, just, it's located just northwest of, of Logan Airport. And there's a far, fairly high concentration of, um, of, of, of housing, uh, commercial, industrial activities, and it's also complicated by the fact that it's a designated port area. So um, a couple of things. Um, we first worked on, started working about adaptation planning in East Boston. We held a community forum to ask people what they thought about climate change. And um, 
you know, so they, they talked a little, they, they generally knew about the causes of climate change. They knew that, you know, it was related to carbon dioxide. And they said it might, they knew some about the, the impacts, like some of the words they used were hyperhurricanes, um, uh, uh, in other words like that. Then they also knew a little bit about uh, some of the causes, some of the impacts, like uh, death, they had asthma, they talked about end of human nature, um, so sickness, they knew some about the impacts. They also knew a little bit about some of the global uh, uh, solutions, like, like research, Kyoto protocols, they also mentioned Al Gore. But no one mentioned adaptation, no one knew or thought about how are they gonna adjust to the changing climate, okay? Uh, so, uh, just like many people in the last couple of decades, no one has really thought about how we adjust to the changing climate. Now, in East Boston, um, we're thinking about a couple of, uh, uh, you know, illustrative strategies. One is part of the shoreline there is already hardened. And, um, and, and, and we could protect this with a, a seawall that is adjustable. So th this seawall is actually somewhat modular. So as the climate changes, you know, we could just add more, uh, we could expand the seawall to adjust to the rising sea levels. Another strategy we're looking at is uh, in an area like, uh, an area where you might be able to put a beach, we're thinking we would actually would construct a beach. And the beach would have several uh, advantages. First of all, it would provide an amenity to the community. Okay, they would have, they'd have a beach area. Second of all, again, as I pointed out, a beach is somewhat flexible for adaptation. Again, if the civil rises more than we thought, we can just put more sand on the beach to protect us. So it's an adjustable infrastructure system. Also in East Boston, we're looking at the current evacuation plan. The city of Boston actually has an evacuation plan for uh, East Boston. It delineates uh, emergency centers where you go. If you can't get out the city yourself, they have routes to evacuate by. Uh, unfortunately, with, uh, uh, if, if we have increased flight in the future, many of the routes would be flooded and some of the evacuation centers would also be flooded. So we've got to think about, you know, are these evacuation routes going to work in the future? And um, there's also the option of permanent retreat. But um, the question is, how would you move like a tightly lit neighborhood like East Boston to another area? And then also, where would they go? I mean, uh, Boston is pretty well built up. So where, where would a group like this go? Um, and then uh, another issue is flood proofing. And flood proofing, um, and they talk, we can elevate structures. We can, we can uh, uh, allow the basements to flood. You just get everything out of the basement so if it floods, it floods and there's no loss. Or we can actually like barricade the basement so it wouldn't get flooded. And um, for those that can see, somewhere along here there's a slide that uh, just shows a elevated structure in, um, in the Mid-Atlantic region. And finally, uh, before I close, I just want to point out a, um, a policy the Dutch are thinking about, or actually are implementing for, adapting, for adopting to, uh, to climate change. And it's called living with water or making room for the river. And the Dutch you know, are famous for you know, their engineering to keep the water out. But they've realized that that's, that may no longer, uh, no longer be possible under climate change. So now they're saying, okay, in our areas, we're gonna allow, let's say, rivers to flood, and we're gonna allow uh, other areas to flood. But it's gonna be controlled flooding, and it's gonna be designed so that um, it's, it's not gonna cause all sorts of social and environmental impacts. So they really realize that, you know, we're gonna start living more with nature. And um, we're also doing things like that in this country. I believe in the Missouri River Basin, after the disastrous floods they, hear, they had there in the 1990s, to make more of an effort to restore the natural floodplain. So this is again uh, a new, a, a, sort of a more comprehensive, holistic way of thinking about adapting, trying to restore some of these natural processes. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to point out that that sea level rise is one of the clearest signals of climate change we have. You know, it integrates many of the global uh, uh, impacts of climate. Second of all, um, sea level rise is going to have serious economic, social environmental impacts in conjunction with uh, other climate and other, uh, and other kinds of stresses. But I want to point out that a range of adaptation strategies exist, but their selection is going to require, require, require wise, thoughtful planning that's, really, that's complicated by civil rise uncertainty. 
But I want to end on a, on a ray of hope in that we, don't, we, do, we do know how to do adaptation planning, and we just need the opportunity to carry that out before we uh, feel the major consequences of climate change. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> You are joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Paul Kirshen discussing the threat of sea level rise. Uh, if you have questions to formulate, please um, address them to the central microphone. I'll ask one in uh, preparation as others get to the microphone. How widely known among city planning officials are such things as the maps you had of Cambridge and the like, or is this pretty much within consulting groups like Patel or in university circles? No, it's interesting. The last um, couple of years, um, many, many, many major cities in the United States have really uh, got very involved in adaptation planning, and they're doing mapping similar to what I'm doing. I mean, San Francisco is very active, Miami-Dade, New York City, Chicago, uh, you know, all, all you know, parts of Connecticut. So they're all grabbing onto this and really looking at their vulnerabilities. Does it make sense for a city like Cambridge to do this, or should we be joining with Boston, uh, Chelsea? Uh, yeah. Is there a regional kind of approach? Right. Um, yes. I mean, you know, that the sea does not respect political boundaries, and climate change doesn't respect political boundaries. So many of our impact um, adaptations are going to have to be be regional. And for example, um, I understand the, the four counties around Miami and Florida have gotten together. And um, you know, so obviously Cambridge and Boston are gonna have to cooperate about the flooding in the Charles River Basin. What happens in Mystic River is gonna require corporate cooperation on the Mystic River um, uh, city. So again, you know, we're talking about you know, the, one of the old principles of, 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 of natural resource management, which is like you know, watershed-based, you know, geophysical-based planning. The floor is open. Close your uh, Susan Shamel, thank you for your talk. I have, first of all, a comment. I think um, adaptation is certainly going to be necessary, and we certainly need to think about it. But I hope it doesn't distract us from the real issue in that we have to cut carbon dioxide, because if we really get um, runaway greenhouse effects with the methane melting and um, you know, sulfur ocean, there's no way we can adapt to it. And I think it would be easy for the deniers or people to say, oh, it's okay, we'll adapt. I heard Ms. Michaels speak um, a year or so ago, a uh, former weather person. And, and she said, you know, well, in the past, people have just migrated, so it's okay. And I don't want that kind of attitude no. developing. Um, and I have just another question or point. I think it behooves all of us to get more politically active. And I wondered if you'd be willing to uh, write a letter to our new senator just talking about some of these issues and get your fellow yeah. Yeah, scientists um, to do it. Yeah, I, I would be glad to um, write a letter to uh, yeah. Senator Brown. And also, um, it's, I want to point out that um, you know, mitigation is the first step towards adaptation. But unfortunately, the, you know, we can't reverse climate change. We have to be prepared for the problems that are going to come. And um, I also want to point out that you know, we're going to have problems in, in, the, you know, in the West, but in the developing world where I do a lot of work, their challenges are, are really, really, uh, uh, very, very challenging. And it's going, to be lot, very more, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to adapt to climate change. So we've got to do a lot to help out ourselves, but also the developing world. Yeah, um, mine really reflects kind of what you just said. Um, isn't, uh, you spoke about environmental justice, and isn't, wouldn't, adapting here in Boston where we're fairly privileged and stuff, wouldn't that in a way, like it would make people feel safe, like, oh, we don't have to worry about that. But in, but that's, they don't get a wake up call where in like the developing world, this horrible thing is happening and that you can just feel safe in Boston because you're fine and you're not being affected. But that just is a further divide between the two. And right. Yeah. Um. That's, that's, a, that's a real problem. Um, I, I also do a lot of work in West Africa. And uh, I was over there you know, 10 years ago. I remember some old village chief said to me, you know, uh, we have a lot of problems with agriculture because we aren't getting enough water. It's more variable now. And they said it's because our climate is changing. So they're, they're really feeling it. And I think farmers in this country are also feeling climate change. But you're right. If we, uh, you know, get insulated from it, we're not going to realize the seriousness of the problem. But on the other hand, I mean, 
Uh, the military, the U.S. military, is very concerned about climate change because of the global unrest it's going to cause. You know, Haiti, you know, terrible, terrible what happened in Haiti, but it was one little isolated incident. You know, under climate change, most of the countries around the equator are really going to become very stressed. So we're going to have, geo, so we're going to have global, you know, geopolitical stress. And it's not going to be one little country. It's going to be the whole belt around the equator. So that's going to be hopefully saying a signal to us that, you know, we ought to be doing something because it's going to create a lot of military and political stress. I feel like there's no better signal than in your own backyard, so I'm not sure adaption is like however good it is in some yeah. ways might be the wrong step. Well, I think, you know, uh, we do have an obligation to take care of our society here as well, though. But it's also, it's also good to see, though, that one of the uh, uh, parts that came out of, 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 of Copenhagen was a pledge, I think, of... Um, about, what, $30 million a year to the developing world for adaptation and mitigation starting in 2012, yeah. growing to $100 million by 2020. Now, again, some of that is for mitigation. Hmm? Billion. Billion, billion, right, billions, okay. So it's, it's like, I think it was like $30 billion starting in 2012 and $100 billion by um, uh, 21, 2020. And, of course, some of it's going for mitigation, some of it's go to adaptation. But, again, it, it, it's, it's realizing that, you know, there's a problem in the developing world and they need assistance. Well, um, my name's Mary Gilbert. About the, um, the question that was just raised, there's no indication in the accord, in its great big three pages, that uh, that, that will be new money, or where that money is gonna come from. So whether that means anything or not is uh, a big question. Um, what I wanted to ask about was my understanding that um, <clears throat> just the way climate, way, the way an increase in heat is supposed to affect the Arctic at a much greater ratio than it will further down, I think that the level of sea level, level of sea level rise will be much greater around the big fat equator because of the spinning of the Earth. Do you have any information on um, how much of a difference we can expect as we come from the North Pole further south and then further south again? And um, anything about the small island developing states, the SIDS position in any of this? Because they're mostly tropical. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't have um, uh, any, de any detailed information on that. I, I'm, I said earlier, I'm an engineer, and I take the scientists from the scientists like Ron Prin. So I don't know exactly what the civil rise is going to, how it's going to vary. I don't know exactly how the civil rise is going to vary over the Earth's surface. But I do know, you know, a lot of the small island states are really, um, are really in trouble. I mean, I've done some work in the Bahamas and the Caribbean, and you, and you can see the potential impacts down there. Yes. Uh, Kim Knowlton, thanks so much for your talk and your work. I'm I looking was, forward to yours. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering about your work that you referred to in Boston and your incredible findings about the 100-year floodplain. Is the city of Boston uh, have any ideas in mind to take that into account in terms of their um, you know, floodplain management or building codes or anything yeah. like that in future? Yeah, I, I, I forgot to mention, Boston and, and the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, act, actually have active um, uh, ad adaptation planning programs going on right now. And they're both, both uh, groups are, are formulating adaptation policies, which will be coming out in the spring. And part of those policies are going to be, I think, new regulations about floodplain management and so on. But, you know, they've seen this information, other information, and it's, it's contributing to the process. But it's, it's, you know, my work and certainly the work of others that's, that's feeding those committees, like the good work you guys are doing down in New York City. Great. Thank you. I had a question, Paul. In terms of citizen action, we turn to municipal governments or regional governments and the like, but one of the most electrifying images that we saw in passing here was the question of, you know, whose feet are going to get wet? Um, and there's a kind of public communication problem embedded in that. How widely should a projection map like that be circulated? Um, it's similar to the problem that Ron had with projections into the future of um, hyperbolic curves, you know. You don't know what kind of confidence to put in this. And it can be quite explosive on the one hand and backfire on the other in the sense that it can 
not lead to an increased responsibility, that is quite literally a response ability, it can lead to a kind of freeze off and a collapse of responsibility. I think um, you know, risk communication and, and climate change adaptation is really about risk management. It's certainly a challenge. And um, I'm by no means an expert in that. When, when, when I work with communities by adaptation, we show them impacts associated with ranges of sea level. And we talk about it, taking actions that, that work no matter what. Now, I actually think the, these, these, these maps we show the extent of flooding are not really um, valuable, but they aren't really enough. Because it's really the depth of flooding you worry about. You know, if an area just gets flooded, well, how deep is it? You're really interested in the depth of flooding. So now I'm working with colleagues to develop maps of what we call the economic floodplain, which actually shows how much economic damage you get to buildings and contents and mass transportation systems and so on that, that, some, that, that accompany the flooding. Because that really gets people's attention. Because when you do adaptation planning, just when you do any, any other kind of plan, you have to look at the benefits and cost. And you're looking at you know, the, um, you know, the, the, the benefits of adaptation protection versus the cost of doing that. And of course, you're doing this with uncertainty and probabilities. When you look at the expected values and, you, and, you, and the expected costs versus the expected benefits, it all, I, I, every case I've seen, it makes sense to take action now as opposed to waiting. So I have one more point about these, uh, about these maps. I mean, we want to show the, the dollar cost. We also want to show the social cost. You know, what, what, what populations are getting flooded? We also want to show the environmental impacts. So this, like, again, like any kind of planning, we've got to look at multiple criteria. We've got to look at economic impacts, social impacts, environmental impact, and so on. Again, it sounds complicated. It's, it's somewhat expensive, but it, it's worth the investment. And we've started thinking more that way. I'm sorry. Hi, just a question about saltwater wetlands. And uh, it's sort of ironic to be concerned about all the flooding that's going to occur in our low-lying Boston and Cambridge areas. But we're, you said we're going to be losing our saltwater wetlands as they become flooded. And I understand that because of development right up to the wetlands, there's no new wetlands that would be created as sea level rises. I didn't hear you talk about any adaptation there. I know those wetlands serve all kinds of functions, right. uh, particularly, uh, for example, our New England fisheries are already in trouble, and there are a number of species that use those wetlands for reproduction. And um, Is there anything you civil engineers can do to address <laughs> adaptation for saltwater yeah. wetlands? Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's the um, it's biologists I work with that, that work on that. But you can, build, you, can, you can build up the wetland. You can make the wetland higher. You can artificially increase the height of the wetland and make, and, and make it more resilient. You know, there's, there's a pretty good practice of restoring wetlands. So I believe in, in, in uh, New York City, they're actually making an effort to restore some of the wetlands, build them up, make them more resilient to deal with the changing climate. So we can, you know, protect the wetlands. But the best thing, as I understand it, is to make sure the wetlands can move inland. So try to remove some of these barriers behind them, like development and seawalls and highways, and let them move in naturally. And, then, and then, then I understand they have the highest chance of survival. But again, I also, this, sort of, this sort of raises another point. This is an interdisciplinary problem. You know, you need engineers, biologists, sociologists, economists, lawyers, all sorts of people working on this. Government, and also, all levels of government have to work on this, from the feds right down to the local citizens. It's really going to require a whole different kind of planning. Uh, and a new way of thinking. I mean, you know, all of our institutions were designed under sort of a sta stationary or static climate, but now we have a moving climate. So we have to think about new ways of managing things that are more dynamic. Yes, well, to take an example, not too far away from here, the Charles River itself. Technically, it's not a river. It's an impoundment because, as you pointed out, there's a dam at the end of it, and we have, in a sense, Charles River Pond. Um, <laughs> Charles River Pond, which is in danger, as I understood you to say, of about one foot uh, from storm surge right. on the seaside, where there to be any. On average, um, it's said often that hurricanes of a Category 3 type occur every 70 years or so. And we had the last one in 1938, um, which, if you add 70, were a couple of years beyond due, on average. Um, that would or top the dam as maybe some other things would. But if sea level's rising, you're saying we'd get that almost every three years, maybe every... Yeah, we, yeah. Could, we could get... Um, 
let's see, yeah, yeah, it would, it would become a lot more common. It would okay. become like, you know, um, every couple of decades. Now, a lot of our other infrastructure is right there along the pond, as, you, as yeah. we might call it, the, and mainly our transportation infrastructure, all of Star Drive, right. uh, all of um, the Memorial Drive on the Cambridge side, a lot of things go over the bridge, um, on bridges. Other things like uh, Kenmore Square in Boston get flooded already. I mean, you right. may recount for us what happened in the, the big storms uh, in, in it, our memory. In was fact, it 1998, I think? We had a really bad storm. That's right. And it flooded the, uh, the T station in Kenmore Square, and the Green Line was shut down for, I believe, several, several weeks. It was. And that was really flooding from the Muddy River, okay? The other, the other thing is, you know, I talk about the Charles River flooding, right? Because you get a storm surge going up over the, over the dam. And incidentally, I mean, it wouldn't cost that much to obviously raise the dam. But water, we also believe that water would seep around behind the dam when the, when the sea level rise gets high enough. So it's a little more complicated than just raising the dam. Um, also, you know, um, our, our, the storms which, which cause the coastal flooding tend to bring a lot of rain. So also you're going to have, you know, runoff coming down the Charles River Basin coming from upstream, then upstream, then coming, then coming, you can have the runoff coming downstream, and then the storm going upstream, meaning the basin. So it's going to be worse flooding than, than we showed. Right, and that's in a sense what's different from 1938 again, because there's a lot more of what geologists call impermeable right. surface uh, since 1938. We built up a lot more shopping malls and roads and right. roofs and everything where water runs off instead of percolates down. Right. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, there are things going on besides cli climate change planning is complicated by, you know, land use change, globalization, population growth. They're all going to be looked at simultaneously because right. they're all drivers of change. So they're all going to be considered. And, and right now, some are more important than others. So is there a way you could go to one town after another to the civil engineering department and say, look, your infrastructure was built for these specifications. Um, guess what? The specifications have just changed. Uh, wouldn't you start all future planning on the basis of these new specifications? Yeah, Instead of arguing on a climate change thing, this is kind of an infrastructure question. Right. I, I think that, I mean, that's what's happening. I think most cities um, realize that the climate, most, most engineers realize the climate is changing. And when they build infrastructure, if it's new, they, they make it a little more climate resilient. They build the bridge a little higher, build the road a little higher, maybe build the sewer drain a little bit bigger and things like that. So they're doing what they can. Um, but um, it, it's, um, the big one of the biggest challenges though is in terms of coastal flooding, is deciding what developed areas you protect and what areas you're gonna let go. Because obviously we can't protect every single developed area. So how do you make that decision? And uh, if you do protect it, what sort of protection do you, do you provide? The other question is, you know, how do you pay for it? And, um, you know, I'd like to make a little plug for this. I mean, you know, everyone talks about this cap and trade uh, system that hopefully will get in place in the next couple of years. Um, I think most of that money right now is going to go, most of the revenue from that is going to go towards, uh, you know, subsidies and energy efficiency. Well, some of that money should, a large portion of that money should also go towards adaptation. Because the cities and towns and individuals, you know, this problem was caused collectively by us. The cities and towns don't have the money to deal with it. So it's really going to require some sort of federal funding. And the cap and trade mechanism is probably the best way to raise that revenue. Cap and Or whatever. <laughs> um, some sort of system that's going to raise, you know, a carbon tax system, something like that is going to have to create the revenue to pay for adaptation. Very good. I love being in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you pointed to what the Dutch have done. Among other things, what they've done is design buildings that float. <laughs> Do you think that's a uh, proposition we could think about here in Cambridge? Um, you know, I, um, I, 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 I like to sail, so I have several boats in my backyard right now. <laughs> so I, I'm all set. Um, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, the, the Dutch are known, are known as innovators. And I think um, if that's going to work for some people, it's going to work. It's not a bad idea. Um, again, it, it's, it's a wonderful time for, uh, to be creative. And if we, if, we capture, if we take advantage of this, to really think about how we're going to live with this changed climate. Um, and and I, um, I might point out, there's, there's, you know, 
there's a lot to be learned by, you know, the Europeans are ahead of us in adaptation. And there's a lot to be learned by, by working with them and seeing what they're doing. And I'm actually involved in a, in a research project now with some colleagues at uh, USGS and other uh, institutions, working with the Dutch and the French, hopefully with some cities around here, to work jointly on, on adaptation in these countries with knowledge sharing between us. Because that's the only way we're going to deal with this problem, is, is, is learn as we go along. We can't afford for every, every city, every community to reinvent the wheel. Right. Well, we'll keep an eye on you. You say you have two uh, sailboats in your backyard. <laughs> if it starts raining for 40 days and 40 nights, yeah. <laughs> see what Paul does. Um, other Tufts faculty members have moved out to the Berkshires. This yeah. may be another indication. Different I kinds suppose. of adaptation. If you want shorefront property, think of Newton these days, I think, is the effort. But in any case, please join me in thanking Paul Kirsten for uh, this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.